my name is Notepad Anon, and I write games for fun. But we're not looking at it. We're not writing a game today. We're actually going to be looking at three very distinct games by the same guy, in fact. A, a prolific author in the Japanese tabletop role-playing sphere known as Ryu Kamiya. And he has done quite a few different games. If we open this up right now, and it's actually working, you get to see he's done... The three games we're going to be looking at today are very different from each other, but also at the same time, distinctly themselves. And I'll get to that to a minute. However, the first game we're going to be looking at is Made, the role-playing game. Then we're going to be looking at Necronica, the long-lost sequel. And finally, we're going to be looking at Golden Sky Stories. And yes... All of these are done by the exact same person. These may look very different, and they play differently. But at the end of the day, they're all still done by him. Now, who is Ryukamiya? Well, Ryukamiya is technically one of the lead designers of this. Uh, I'm gonna fucking horribly butcher Sukaha Sukahagi Hanpi. And if we do a little bit of investigation, actually, even though, fun fact, I already know the ending to this. I put a three in there because I'm an idiot. Pete. Fun Pete. It's pretty much, uh, actually, Suganagi Hampi, uh, would be... Put that in there. The fuck is it? Damn it. Pretty much that's his company. Or the best way... On Poe. On P. God, I'm an idiot. Uh, they are... It's pretty much him, but it's their design circle. And in Japan, one of the major things is design circles. Pretty much a small group of creators that all get together and do things together. This is Ryukamiya's. This is his baby, and this is where he public technically publishes all of his games through this circle. And it's actually really interesting. Mostly because the way he does things is distinctly Japanese. And his Japanese design theory is possibly one of the most fascinating things when it comes to game design in general. Because you have to understand how and why... Japanese uh, designers do the things that they do. And of course, feeling how I'm a professional and I definitely know what I'm doing, I asked a, a, a helpful individual. Is that it? No, no, that's that's not it. Oh god. Is this it? No, that's not it. Nothing is here anymore. Is it? Nope. That's definitely not it either. Is this it? Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Ta-da! Don't worry. I know what I'm doing. I consulted one of the people in the J JTRPG Discord. And in for their assistance in trying to explain why Japanese RPGs are kind of the way they are. Be And I'm going to read this verbatim just for those who aren't watching the video. Well, the easiest reason to say why Japanese RPGs tend to be one-shots is to explain that what two Western RPGs came to Japan. These two games were oriented around their one-shot linear adventures that you pick up and play, Call of Cthulhu and the Battletech RPG. These two, big, these two games had a bigger focus on being easy to pick up and having adventures that were pretty much linear scenes. This is especially true of Battletech, where the Japanese adventures were pretty much scripts in between combat missions. Of course, how these became big is another issue. Japan has two major limits to it, time and space, and slightly so noise. All define what a, uh, all define a lot about Japanese culture. It's culturally acceptable that couples will need to go to a hotel to have sex. There's a sign of a lack of privacy. A lot of Japanese living spaces are small, cramped, and likely apartments, hardly a place you can have a party at. So a lot of RPGs are played after school and clubs or by renting out spaces at places like karaoke booths. 
add in issues with campaign-focused RPGs. In Western TRPG design, there's a philosophy of not giving the players all their treats yet. That's there's got to be something for later for them to see a game mechanically blossom into something greater. Japanese games don't do that. What you get in the first session is most likely what you're going to get for the entirety of the game. This means that you can fully experience the system in one session, which helps with how they write their adventures, but also means that games can be made not to monopolize their time. You don't have to settle for one RPG for half a year or longer. You can play a different game once a week and get the full experience of the game's mechanics. Imagine if I were to ask you to play a board game that would take four hours to play one game, and we were expected to play one game every week for half a year. Now imagine if I offered you to play one game a week that would take no more than two hours a game, and we'd play one after one or another one the next week. So, kind of doubling up on that. One of the key things about Japanese RPGs is that there's a lot of, and I've discussed this before, notably called what I like to call front-loaded character design. Everything about the game is usually done by the time it hits that end point. And by the time your character is done, that's pretty much what you're going to have. And this is cool. This is interesting. Because it does prompt a lot of little situations that kind of force you to think outside the box. One other thing that they didn't really mention in that, however it is important nowadays, well actually in the before times, was that dice was real expensive. To get a full set of dice, for example, would be $10 here, and this is your D20, D8, D12, whole nine yards, would be, say, $10. However, for them, it would be about 20 almost double the amount for the same thing. Now, to a lot of people, that's not like, oh, well, that's not that much, but if you're playing a game that, again, you don't play very often or anything like that, you may be tempted to not do that. that. That becomes suddenly an investment, something bigger you have to invest in. So what happens is a lot of Japanese tabletop RPGs tend to not rely on those mechanics. They don't rely on D20. They don't rely on a lot of little dice. What they do rely on, though, is what is easily available, that being D6s. A lot of the games we're going to be going over today are D6. Two, two of the game, actually, one of the games we're going over today is D6 based, and the other is a single D10 based. While uh, Golden Sky Stories you see here is technically diceless, but I do have a few other Japanese RPGs kind of lined up, and a lot of those do rely on D6s. This brings me to Ryu Kamiya. Kamiya is, well, an auteur. He is an artist when it comes to these things, and I love him for it. His games are kind of odd even among, you know, the ja Japanese sphere. And the reason for that is kind of a twofold thing. One, he's allowed to. And two, this is what he enjoys. So he made his own game, doing what he wants. Because why not? Isn't that why everyone designs various games? Now... We also have a problem here, in the stateside, that be- OBS decided to have a shit fit, because that's- that's just what happens. Uh, it might have been because of the music, I'm gonna turn on another piece of music, that usually sometimes helps. Uh, there we go, let's turn on the classic. Okay, everything should be good now. Okay, we're good now. Yeah, <laughs> welcome to the uh, welcome to the pee pee poo poo hour with uh, OBS, where OBS has a goddamn stroke every time it tries to do anything. Why is it doing this? I don't know. Yeah, the, yeah, the, uh, oh yes, the Japanese RPG. I don't know where you last heard of me, however, uh, I will kind of reiterate kind of the... He's an auteur, he's an odd oddity. He makes games that kind of focus on him, and we, we as an American Western audience, we have a bad tendency of... The best way to say it is liking weeb shit. 
Now that may seem like a very uh, affectionate term. However, that's really all I can say. It's it's weeb shit. We love weeb stuff. Weeaboo garbage that we enjoy because we see things that they think would appeal to us. We like that Japanophile concepts behind things. We don't really enjoy what they would consider normal. We want, aha, the wacky Japanese things. Hence why we got, looking here, we got Golden Sky Stories, Necronica, as a fan, or, you know, fan, the made RPG, and a plethora of other games. Uh, let me see which ones. No, that's not it. Come on, give me the right, give me the right one. Come on, baby. Uh, Shina Begami, Tenor Bansha Zero, Tokyo Nova, Kur yeah, Kuro the Art, Kuro RPG, Double Cross. We're seeing a lot of those games that come out because they are the wacky, weird stuff. And Ryutama, perfect example. Ryutama is, it's, it's odd. Because you, you think like, oh, wow, you know, we don't, like, we, it's all these very Japanese games, looking games, acting games, but we have yet to receive a full translation of Sword World, one of their most popular RPGs over there. We've never received a full, legit translation. We have, you know, we haven't seen a couple of these other games, two from Ryokamiya, actually, uh, let me see if I can bring them up real fast, uh... Uh, Ryukamiya. Uh, let me see. He also did... We'll go to the curse site. Uh, apparently, Zetai Reido is coming out soon, TM. It has been coming out soon, TM, for a while now, fan translation-wise. Draco Scourge. There is... The Raws are out there, but nobody's translated it yet. Uh, Detako Saga, no, I don't think anyone's really touched that. And we have to think to ourselves, well, why? You know, look, he's such the, you know, his other games have been translated and have been brought over. Why not these ones? Zetai Reido's too weird. Honestly, it's too weird. They're too horny. Draco Scourge is vampires, and it doesn't pitch that immediate Japanness that people love. We eat that shit up. We, that's how you get my Kamigakari. That's another good example of one that got picked up and got translated officially on Kickstarter, of all things. Even though it's not really that good, but we don't talk about that. But I think that's one of the major issues we face here in the West about kind of getting those Japanese RPGs in our own, in, in our place, in our homes. Because they are odd. They're weird. And we like those odd, weird games. So, the cycle that we're going to go through, we're going to go through our three games today. Uh, we're going to go through Made first. Then we're going to go through Necronica. And then we're going to end off on Golden Sky Stories. Now, you may be wondering what this boy, what this boy is doing here. Well, uh, this is mostly for Necronica. Because there are some naughty bits in Necronica that I am going to have to censor, and uh, what that'll be is me putting this over it. So, uh, understand, that's going to happen. I don't believe there's anything in Made. We're not going to look at the Made, quote, expansion book, end quote, uh, because I don't want to, and there's a lot of things in there that Twitch will uh, make very suggestive comments at me, uh, usually probably involving me getting ya yeeted out of the site. So... We're going to be playing things safe, and we like safe things here. So, let's get down to it. So, Maid RPG is exactly what you think it is. It is a game about maids in RPG form, but it's also... 
one of the most bizarre games I've ever had the pleasure of playing. Because the main RPG is perhaps one of the best design games I've ever played. It's very odd saying that. It's a game about fucking anime maids, for God's sakes. How can it be well designed? I did not dress as a maid. However, if I had more time today, the uh, the V Sona would be in a maid outfit. That might be next time, though. Uh, note made, yes. But it was so well designed because it does exactly what it says on the tin. And it plays into the tropes. It plays into the harem anime tropes. It plays into the wacky and the weird and the over overtly animu. An anime animu style things. Even down to the cover art, which for God's sakes, look at it. There's there's your lolly, there's your demon maid, there's your emotionless maid. Good God, what more do you want? However, this isn't just the maid RPG. Oh no. Of course not. Because there's source books. There's three, there's two source books for this game. And this isn't dealing with the cut content either for the translation over over to the states. We have Koisodo Medo, Maids in Love, and Dreaming Maids, or Yume Meru Medo. But yeah, it's like all of these are options in this game. Look how fucking anime it is, even down to the character sheets. Like. <laughs> You have the little frilly parts all around. You have the little, yeah, you know, the, uh, the flowers in the background. But are you noticing something about this? Even that's the character sheet right now. This is incredibly simple. There's no second character sheet. Like, this is, this is it. This is your basic character sheet. And uh, if you want, like, more, I guess you can get, like, some more stuff down here. But you don't really need it. And hell, that, this is the advanced option. This is simple. This is the most basic character you can create. It's nothing. And that's one thing about Mate is that it's so light. It's so simple. That that's what it's supposed to be, though. And then we also have Tenra Bench and Zero, which will get its own review. But it's strange. Because usually I don't like light, light RPGs. I'm not a huge fan of them. Never have been a huge mega fan of games like those. But made kind of won my heart. And it's why also, uh, we should also note, this game is technically... Sutsude uh, Exposition. Uh, technically this game came out 6, 16, 17... Uh, yeah, this game is 17 years old. <laughs> yeah, this game is 17 years old. This is older than people ch in high school right now. This fucking game has been around that long. However, the game itself only came out in 2008. So, it has a little bit of... It's been, it was four years. Yeah, it was four years after it came out, before it even came out. This was one of the first JR JTRPGs to actually come out and hit the West. And, again, it wasn't Sword World. Oh, no, it was the, let me reiterate this real quickly, the fucking made RPG. So I think you're kind of already seeing some of the quirks of... Th this game and how, why, what things get translated and what doesn't. So, we have our basic what is an RPG and uh, things you might need. Friends. Things you probably won't need. Shame. <laughs> and a made costume. Uh, yeah, you don't need, you don't need a made costume to play the made RPG, which um, I feel to be a disservice, however. Uh, note made soon, TM. 
and this is how you roll the dice. Everything is D6 based in this game. It does not matter what you do. It is D6 based. D1, D66, D666. And this is the game. Congratulations. I have successfully explained to you how to actually play the game. And let's, <laughs> yep, basic glossary of stuff. Uh, also, the joy of maids. Read more maids. Uh, let's see, and our, our character attributes. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to do something a little bit special today. Uh, so give give me one one a millisecond. Uh, this is on sub TG. Right here, uh, where you can randomize your own maid. So what, what's our maid name going to be? Uh, let let let's do um something incredibly basic yuki hanamura we will of course be 17 years old and uh random everything is random now everything is random generate maid guess what we are we have two in athletics like yeah congratulations oh no 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 oh oh no 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 uh oh no uh, uh no there we go uh uh, well, we can't we can't show that last one there. So, so yeah, like this is this is literally it. Roll two d six, divide by three, rounding down for each of the six attributes below, and roll your attributes. Oh God, that's why my mouse has been freaking out. <laughs> Turn my fucking trackpad off. Yep, congrats, yep, this is, we, we made a maid, everyone, good job. And that kind of summarizes almost the entire game at this point. So again, you roll your attributes, 2D, random ma random time, uh, and then you determine the maid types. Roll 1D6 twice and get two maid types, if you can have a particular maid twice. Apply the bonuses, uh, then you choose your made colors, and then your special qualities. The special qualities are the most entertaining part. So, technically, you can just roll whatever the hell you want. And, yeah. Affection score times 2, your spear is will score times 10. Yeah. And then, etc. Made roots, express explosion, if you're using that, or your made weapon. Like, arguably... The game excels when you hit things like this. Glasses, freckles, sickly, albino, actually a guy. You have elf ears, you're secretly a princess. You have an injury, you have a tragic love, you have a secret job, you're just absurd. It's... and then you have all the other tables. And that's... Probably some of the oddest things about this game, and the part that really... That sold me on the main RPG, more than anything. Your character is random. You feel random. And it... Embraces it. Now mind you, is this... Even like when it comes to the accent things... Is this what is in the original game? No. I can guarantee fucking to you. It, you don't... This is not anything what we would consider the original draft of things. Because again, Southern... This is probably an Okinawan accent. British is probably British. Pigeon English, probably not. Meow, yeah, at night, maybe. Foreigner... Mexican, Nigerian, Indian, Canadian. That's kind of like, this is probably, all of these are usually probably folded under Foreigner. Which has its per quirks and has its own issues. But every single part, yeah, we also have the uh, perversion table, which you can also as the relationship table. Uh...
Mr. Hansen, I swear. It's only the game. But it's it plays up to its types, and this is literally all you do. Do these have any mechanical value? No. No. This is not... It, there's no mechanical backing to any of this. But that's not the point. The point is... Uh, here, let, let's... Let's roll up a new... A new Meidu here. Uh... Uh, sky blue, sky blue, black. Why is it every time? Like, there we go. I'm sickly. I have black leather gloves, and I'm actually a fox. F windows to the soul. I, I use a wood sword and a staff, and uh, I t I drink to get my problems away. Yeah, that is. Yeah. It's, this is what you're trying to do more than anything, and this is arguably the game that encourages this. It's the rolling your fucking maid attributes a bajillion time, being like, guys, I'm an android, angel, got a big old ribbon, and I'm also a neat freak. Holy shit. Yeah, otaku is a criminal tendency, don't you know? It's like you don't know the wild, terrible world of otakus. But... Also, secret... Secret job. Procreator. Daojin artist. It's... It's completely insane. It's madness. But that's the amusing part. It's absurd. It's odd. It's weird. And... Embrace the chaos of it. And honestly, like, none of this matters, mechanically speaking. That's the oddest part. Hey, you know, here's my maid. Well, stress explosion kind of has mechanics, but not really. All this is just the story. And that story, though, is already done. And, um, how do I word this? That story is already being written by the time everyone's done with their characters. Exactly, it's have fun. And but by the time everyone has finished their characters, by the time everyone has concluded, you're all looking at each other and being just like, guys, I am Maydu. Uh, I'm a stupid, sexy maid, and uh, don't worry about it. I'm also a mummy, and I'm also a robot. And then someone else is like, bruh, bruh. I'll have you know, I, as a Meidu, who's also a... A lot of L's. Uh, I'm also, look, I'm just the, the cool... I, I should stop rolling, please. God. Like, hey, I'm a super scientist, you know, person. Or I'm like... I'm a, I'm a fucking fox girl, for God's sakes. I'm also greedy, and I imagine... If, like, everyone... Like, you immediately have that... Kick. Yeah, that is possible. You can get boyish two times, and you can select it twice. You're just really playing into that trope. And... You get tom tomboy, tomboy. Um... Hashtag tomboy supremacy. Um... I think that's one of the oddest parts about these this game, and I think the part that I enjoy the most is the fact that it is such a simple game, and it's like, oh hey, 
Yeah, I have a ray gun. Does the ray gun do anything? No, you just have a weapon. That's just what you have. If it comes up, sure, it comes up. Play with the narrative. Or like, okay, now. Now we have our maid powers. Highest attribute is athletics. And then it's like, super evasion. Completely avoid a single attack. Trespass. Intrude on a battle or a love seal. <laughs> like... It's like these even don't even feel very impactful, mechanically speaking, but it doesn't need to. Because let me iterate, reiterate, you're playing a fucking game about being maids. I'm not expecting you to play this seriously, and it, it kind of acknowledges that. It's like, yeah, you totally have the power, the literal power of friendship and that you can just gain stress to remove other people's stress, which stress kind of acts like your health. Or, yeah, you can, if you have a high cunning, <laughs> you can instantly restrain them from doing something indecent. That's an anime trope. You know, the fact that you have traps everywhere, you have fake crying sounds, like you have, you, 4D chess for God's sakes. You know, you can produce anything in the mansion within your maid uniform. Everything has that inherent... Anime bullshittiness to it. Which I love, because I'm a weeb. I'm a fucking weeb. And I... Find that mm, enjoyable. It's odd, strange, even. You want to, you know, make fun of these things. You know, in fact, one of, it's the clumsy demon maid girl. Yeah, of course, laugh at it. Ha ha ha. But it's, you immediately know what you're getting into. When you and the boys roll up and you bring out made the maid RPG, you immediately know what you're going to play. And you kind of enjoy it. You know why. You know what's going to happen. You're going to start crying anytime you feel stressed out. You're going to start, you know, feeling sad. <laughs> and Yep, and now we have the basic mechanics. Catboy made it trendy. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, like, the basic mechanic of the system is roll 1d6 and multiply the result by the attribute you are using in a particular situation. This is really weird. And I appreciate it because it's a little bit odd. So, let's say, for example, I have an attribute of 4. So, I rolled a 3. I have, have a, I rolled a 12, technically. That's it. Roll, your, roll a d6, times it by your attribute. That's it. So, it's odd. Yeah, remember math. Literally, if you know basic math, you can play this game. And it's only a single d6. A d6 you can buy from any corner store, you feel like. You can go anywhere and get a d6 for pennies. It's cheap, it's easy, and you can get these anywhere you want. I actually got a perfect spin there on my D6, and I feel really cool. But, and that's it. Ta-da, you've successfully done it. Your maids are basically pros, and they're... Oh, oh senpai, there you are. Uh, Kamiya-sama. Who is that girl who's peeking from over there? Master Kamiya. Oh, that's Yugami. She's a new maid here. To help out with explaining the system. Yeah, no, there's like absolutely no fourth wall in this fucking explanation. Don't question it. Hee <laughs> senpai. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, no, it, 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 it leans into the anime bullshit. And combat is, all right, time to do combat. Like, all right. It's 
1d6 times relevant attribute. Whenever the action is higher attacking, it wins the round. Uh, are subject to psychological harm in the form of stress. Opponent suffers stress equal to the attack power divided by the attribute of the defender was using to attack. Rounded down. Yeah. It's combat the same way that I'm funny. Not really. <laughs> And there is some odder math here. The math gets sometimes a little bit strange. But if you're really thinking about it, you can have an entire can you can have an entire session. Yeah, it's you can have an entire session where you have nothing. No combat. No, you no one's fighting each other or anything. No things are just getting gradually wackier and weirder and you're taking stress because things are going wrong oh no for example you know with what you uh, just proposed there eric uh the true combat here gets against a pile of dishes we have to clean after the banquet of gojinchi shama no the entire session is leading up to that banquet it's okay who's making the food who's preparing the plates oh no hizumi hizumi chan Who's really short and a lolly? I guess she's fucking having to set all the tables, but she's too short. Ha ha, Lamau. Everyone make fun of her because she's short. Oh no, she's taking stress and she's pulled a gun on us. Oh no, time for wacky hijinks. Or oh no, we don't have any food. Someone has to go down to the store. I guess the robot maid will, and she'll just fly with her rockets. Oh no, everything is on fire now. It. The gradual escalation of the app of the madness of this game tries to emulate that animu bullshit, and it excels at it. I love it. Sample of combat. This is like, all right, so combat rules. Both of them will be used athletics for the Sugamis. They're trying to effectively tackle each other. So I got a four and two, four. Deadlocked. Athletics, three. Three. Oh, five. It's five. So you take... Five. That winner's result of five by the attribute you got me. The loser, in case her attribute is one. Yeah, so it's... You can get some odd things, like, oh, hey, you did five damage, but I have a five in the attribute, so I take one. Like, all right. Odd. You can also... And it's like, oh, here's here's an optional move with your maid uniform. As a thing gets destroyed, you're gradually becoming worse at being a maid. <laughs> yeah, is. Is removing your un is removing your underwear technically a a penalty in this game? Yes, of course it at of course it is, of course it is a, a a thing in this anime bullshit game. Of course, why wouldn't it be? That's the point. It's to sit back, have a few beers, and wonder how the hell you ended up. You know, everyone started speaking in honorifics to one another, and all of everyone having to explain to their Uber driver what the fuck Chan means. Ooh, woo, 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 chan. So, pretty much, when accumulated spirit stress exceeds her spirit rating, she enters a stress explosion. Oh no, a stress explosion! Uh, one. Can't. Yeah. Oh, 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 woo, woo, go, Jinji, Shama, what's this? Yeah, that's a literal mechanic in this game, by the way. That That is a thing. But yeah, it's like, oh, hey, you start stressing out, you go into your stress explosion, and every real minute of time, it goes. But, I want you to recall, one minute of time, doesn't that seem a little bit odd? You have two hours. You have two hours for this game. And uh, in the first 30 minutes, someone has already set something on fire. There is a disaster over here. We are trying to get this fucking banquet going. Someone is already on the floor bleeding to death. And someone is current, you know, currently crying in the corner. We still have an hour and a half before the banquet. 
So you can almost do everything by time alone. Because you have to go fast. So it might it might seem odd being like, oh well, five minutes I reduce five stress. But not really. Because that five minutes is eating into your time, your very limited amount of time. And it encourages it. So, uh, and then we have favor. Favor is, hey, uwu um, uh, uh, We can get people to love me in favor, and you get favor by being good, and you lose favor by being bad. Don't, don't do favor. Don't lose your favor. Yeah, NP, and then we have NPCs. Here's your attributes. Don't think about it. And then random, and don't worry. Here are the random event tables. Why? Because we can have random event tables. Completely random, favor race, daily life, and... This and now we have the at the mansions of madness. This is a haha -ha replay thing, which is another very odd. I think a drink of my coffee. Very odd part of Japanese uh, RPG culture is the concept of replays. We have all told stories about our campaigns to someone. We have all sat down and said, "Hey, you know, th this is what happened in my campaign." This is what happened in my world. This is what happened something in when I was playing with my friends or something. The Japanese kind of take that one step further. People like. People really like playing the game, but sometimes people don't have the time. People don't have the effort. So replays are a very common thing. Arguably, a few popular franchises started as replays. The entire uh, Record of the Lotus War, for example, is technically just a replay of a few guys' D&D game. That's all it was. It was them going through the motions and them talking about it and all the little adventures and all the little weirdness that happened. Apparently, Fate, the entire Fate franchise, uh, actually not Fate necessarily, but more of the Nasuverse in general, was, a, was originally a World of Darkness game gone horribly, horribly wrong. And you have these, it, it's one of those different parts of things that you have to always consider. Yeah, there are session reports printed. And <laughs> you have to, you know, be our demon king, ooh woo. Yeah, like, yeah, it's... Yeah, I do like your, your Meidu. Yeah, it's just games gone off the... Gone off the deep end. And they're reporting them. Yeah, and... That's one of the big things with replays. And that people like to reiterate them. And be like, yeah, of course I want to tell you about something that I enjoy. I played this game once and I thought it was cool. I'm going to put some time into it. And that's actually big fucking money in Japan. Because some light novels started out as something like that. And you can only, and I do know this, is that you can go to bookstores effectively and find replays of like Call of Cthulhu. Of people going through an adventure. And this is our this is our session. You know, we have a writer in our group, and he wrote down everything. And this is our little adventure that we went to. It's a basic Cthulhu story, but it's ooh woo. Look at me, I'm a yeah. Like you can find odd things about it, and it's really interesting, and I really like it. Uh, okay, now now we are at page fifty two of two hundred twenty two. Welcome to the optional rules. Butler tables. The master tables. Mansion creation rules. 
Mansion appearance tables. Optional seduction rules. Yeah, this is not this is a full section on seduction rules. Very important. Uh let's see it. Costume items, events, and weather. Why? If you ever want to know why I'm not really going through these, really, just because there's so fucking many of them. Because, but it's like, oh, here's more items and things and events and weird shit. Oh, we can't forget about apprentices who are like apprentice maid maids who do uwu apprentice stuff. And oh, here's some more replays. And it's like, what? Why? Ooh, ooh, look at this. He pairs up with his lolly girlfriend, I guess. God help me. Shrine, you know, here are shrine, the shrine made extra scenarios. Don't question it. Don't question it. We don't question bad things. This is just my version. There's probably a better version of the actually PDF out there. Uh, which you should totally get, unless you're me, and, and in case I'm just, um, well, oy vey goyim. But all of these are just extra scenarios. Extras, extras, extras. More different things. We need more things. We need different things. Here's some more other things. Here's, here's your waifu. Here's your new waifu. Don't like this waifu? Guess what? Here's another waifu. Don't worry. I think she's like... Uh, that's, that's a bad, uh, don't, uh, okay, don't worry, she's only 11, it's fine, Chris Hansen, get away from me. Like, oh, you don't, you don't like, you don't like Lolly's Battle May, don't like that, don't worry, here's a butler, he's cool, hey, hey look, it's, the uh, look, she's, she's a maid, no, she's a, she's an aristocrat maid, don't, don't worry, here's a shrine maiden, don't worry about it, oh, here's robot maid, don't worry about it, like, there's so much shit in this game, but at the end of the day, the game ends about here. This is where the game ends, on page about 30 of 222. And even then, you can make an argument that it, the game really ends the second you roll your characters up. That's it, the game's over. Everyone just starts losing their minds, and any sort of plot or any sort of ideas is gone. That's one part about May that I don't like very much, is the fact that it's very light, and it's very fluffy, and... You're playing Maid to play Maid. You're not going in there for, like, a time for a gaming experience, boys. We're going in there, we're gonna have a ball. Oh yeah, let's do it. No. You are going into the made RPG to play the made RPG. And you're going to enjoy it. Bitch. Then. Then we get to the second game. <laughs> A very different one. Now, I want you to look at this. I want you to look at this uh, cover right now. As I go all the way down. I want you to look at this. Look how cute and kawaii this is. Look at the big eyes. Look at the, the maid robot. Look at the lolly. Don't look at the lolly too much. Chris Hansen's at your front door. Don't answer it. He's going to get you. The man who wrote this also wrote Necronica. Necronica is by far one of the strangest, bizarre completely insane things you could pitch to anybody you can pitch this game to anybody and they're all going to look at you like the fuck what say that again you no say that again yeah no okay it's about undead necro battle lollies Okay, repeat that. It's about the horrifying future where there are undead only. Everyone's sad. Everyone's miserable. It's also about undead lollies that rip 
that rip people's limbs off, and it is gory, it is horrifying, it is destructive, and the combat system's fucking awesome, and the game is this nightmarish, horrifying, grim, dark world, but everyone's also battle lollies. Battle lollies. Just Necronica Bionicle. <laughs> Uh, you can technically play Bionicles with the Chronica. Go, go Autonomons. Autonomons. Even the name, the Chronica, the long lost sequel. The long, long sequel, technically. <laughs> it's... It's a tra... It, it's... The protagonists of the Chronica are the girls of this world unfortunate enough to possess hearts, the dolls. To put it simply, it is a game in which players become zombie girls and fight against other zombies. The one who caused the dead to wake, the ruler of the, sh of the Shattered World, is the Necromancer. The Necromancer serves as both the master of the game and the arc and arch enemy, for it, it can be none other than the Necromancer who gave the hearts to the dolls, for in a world filled with mindless puppets, the dolls, they alone who possess the wills of their own, are no more than toys. Well, it is four o'clock in the afternoon, so I hope I'm awake. Uh, welcome back, Mecha Girl, by the way. But this game was actually trans. This is a unofficial translation, hence this very large, large unofficial thing here. There is nobody in the right fucking mind would touch this game with a ten-foot pole, let alone even think about trying to pitch it to sub one picture going trying to go on kickstarter and say all right kickstarter under necro battle lollies kickstarter would kick you off you you wouldn't be able to go to indiegogo no one's gonna pick this shit up this is all a community effort no one was paid actually maybe people were paid i don't know but this was a community effort a game that was made by a bunch of people who said, I enjoy this game, I enjoy the ideas, I enjoy the concepts, we're gonna make it. So they did. And I think the full game came out, god, a year and a half ago? Two years ago, Jesus, it's been two years. Now... One of the other thing is, this book contains rules from the main book, the supplements, Garden of the Story, the great drama, Dance of Distortion, and the official errata. This fucking game had three supplement books. Three. Three. <laughs> Which is insane. I mean, how much can you do with a necromantic battle lollies? And a lot. And this is a very dense game. But it's a game I also enjoy. Uh, we will skip the setting information uh, because if you want to read, just download it and read it yourself. Uh, TLDR, shit's fucked. Shit's fucked. Everyone died in Super War and you've been resurrected as Undead Battle Lollies. Uh, yes, exactly. You know, hats off to Ryokamiya for sticking to the vision. And I think that's kind of sums up Ryu Kamiya in my book anyway. He has a vision, he has an idea, and he sticks with it. Through thick and thin, that is going to be his baby, and he takes care of this. Which is why I would always like to see Draco Scourge. I would kill to see Draco Scourge translated, but I don't think it ever will. Because the reason why Necronica got a translation before Sword World is because Necronica is a game that is anime neko, you know, anime battle lollies kill each other versus this is a fantasy game. The people in the West are going to want to sit down. They're going to want to say, me want weird. Me want strange. So the people delivered. And I think that's a, uh, if, if I had infinite money, infinite budget, infinite everything, I would try to translate as much as I can. I would try to get 
as many things over because there's some yeah i would love to see a sword world translation i would love to see an official big old miyuki kingdom game but the games that are coming over and honestly one of the major things actually prompted this curious case was the uh konosuba game finally getting translated officially translated over which is a konosuba game there's nothing really exciting about it it's a fear system very standard role-playing system, fairly basic game, but it has the Konosuba thing on it, and that's strange. Why did that game get, uh, was going to get a translation, an official translation by Yen Press of all fucking people, before any of these other games? And the main reason is because people here love that shit. There's a kid probably at Yen Press sitting down being and he pitched to his boss in an elevator. We, if we translate this over, people are going to buy it. I actually read through the initial, like someone did a really rough translation when the Kona Super RPG came out like two years ago. It's, it's, it's decent. It's actually pretty good. Uh, Azumanga Dio just run it in made. <laughs> Lucky Star run it in made. Or honestly, if you really want, you could probably run a Lucky Star Cane and Golden Sky Stories. But we're not looking at fun things. No, we're looking at the scariest fucking horrifying thing ever. One of the thing is about good old... Oh, okay, wait a second. Um. Okay, yeah, I need to deploy the notepad document. Pixel note. Note pixel, I need you. Uh, actually, I should make the main thing go away. Uh, so, this is going to be the game where I get to cover things up. So, uh, have fun. This is going to be right here the entire time. Uh, if you see anything, you didn't. Remember that. So... These are, this is the first thing we see. This is a sample character. We have no idea how to make characters, but here are some of our sample characters. And you realize that there's no health. I don't know. You get your fucking parts ripped off, though. You're getting your arms ripped off. You're getting your face ripped off. You are getting everything ripped up off. All of these parts gonna get tore off eventually. And... This kind of sum like this arguably sums up the entirety of the game. Look at your look at the cute girl. Look at the fact that she has a battle cleaver and half her face is in her own. Look, everyone, it's a little girl. Except she has a fucking chainsaw. Also, use your chainsaw to kill even gods. And in case you're wondering, what what, what? Ch chain chainsaw? Yeah, that's an option. Just it's a it's a I make an action check cost three AP uh, to uh, just try to dismember someone. <laughs> Don't worry. The abandoned automaton. <laughs> Half her face has been blown off. But don't worry. She has a katana and a teddy bear. So it's... it's this game... This entire game can roughly be summarized as Gap Moe. The game. Being like, hey, here's thing that's not supposed to be cute and thing that is cute. What if we combined them? And everyone was like, fucking genius, Mr. Kamiya. Where do we give this man more money? <laughs> if it was Madoka Magica but with more guts, that would be that would be a lot easier. No 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 no. No no people are too busy getting their fucking heads ripped off. Which you can actually survive from. It is, which weirdly enough, I have. An, I I think there is a magical girl game in Japan, like an official like this is a magical girl game, but not that many. The cries in Pammy, yeah, you know a trigger happy for it because yeah you can just here's a you know an outcast holic, and these are all classes, night wizards yeah. Like you have these are all characters that immediately have an effect on who you are. And like, yeah, here's your boot knife. Uh, 
it's mostly just your leg at this point that happens to be a knife. Now we get to doll creation. This is actually a really fun part because kind of like made in a way. By the time you've finished making your doll, you know exactly who she is. You understand her, you, you know how to play her, and you're immediately in it. You're like, oh yeah, here's my little terrifying angel. She's going to rip my face off with her chainsaw, and she does not like me, and I am terrified of her. But I'm going to play her and make sure she, she's happy. One of the key things is that you're trying to hunt down fragments of memories, because that's kind of the entire gist of the game. There isn't like, okay, everyone, we're going to go on an adventure and try to save, you know, and get some money to save the day. Ha ha ha. Everyone's happy. Clap, clap, clap. No, 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 no. It's like, hey, I have a vague memory that something happened here when I was alive. Let's go to it. Cool. We're going to it. And we're going to kill everything in between us and that thing. And it's also about trying not to go insane, but also going insane pretty easily. <laughs> you know, it's, it's your premonitions and now we get to positions. I actually really enjoy this system, which is the position class. Position dictates what you're doing while class determines how you do it. For example, being an Alice, means you are a person person. You help others, you keep your sisters alive, you are trying to survive this crazy world. You're gonna do that no matter how hard it is. And people trust you. That's one of the big things, people trust you. But then you have things like bollocks, irregulars whose egotistical drive have driven them to madness. You can be a holic but be any of these. You can be a sorority. Be any of these. I remember if I back in the day when I played it, I believe I played a sorority. I believe I played a sorority broke. Because I thought that would be a weird combination. It works exceedingly well. Uh she did not last too long though. That that fight did not go well for any of us. Uh, I did survive. I did not have any legs at the end of it, though. That was not fun. That was not fun for, for Notepad. Thank God I had a gun. <laughs> but, yeah, wake in in the same place, in the same time, as they are their sisters. And skills, pretty much, how do I word it? You don't have skills in the traditional sense. You don't have skills in the idea of, I have a the lock picking skills. I don't, you don't have the stealth skill. No, you have legs that allow me to do something. I have arms that allow me to do things. My arm is a chainsaw. I can't exactly you know, do anything except chainsaw you to death or hey, my I, my leg is a shotgun, and I'm going to fall over and shotgun you in the face using my leg, because I am a psychopath. Those are what skills are. That's kind of that odd definition of skill that sometimes gets muddled between Western and Eastern games, I've noticed. Is that skill to an Eastern game is something fairly big, something very important, while a skill to... Western is like, here's a small part of something greater. Usually we use the term powers. And then we have our reinforcement parts, weapons, guns, and offensive, mutations, my favorite personally, enhancements. And we can have more reinforcement parts. We want more parts. I don't like it. I don't like it. Ori, no, please. This is a Christian stream. This is a, this is a Christian stream, everyone. Christian. <laughs> uh, reinforcement parts are cool. And then we have finally our treasures. Something that we hold dear to our hearts. Something that makes us act human. Makes us remember. 
but also it's something that can be damaged, something that can be hurt. Something that I enjoy. And I've actually done this with other players before. That's more Christian than you would think, Mecha Girl. That's more that is more Christian than you would think. Ow. <laughs> Old Testament, but <laughs> I digress. But I've actually used the treasure system before with other players. Just the idea of, like, here's an item that defines you. What is it? And it's really bizarre what players tend to do. Because those little sentimental items mean nothing, mechanically speaking. But they, they treasure them. This just isn't my item. This isn't just a hat. It's my hat. And they interact with it more. It's that, always that bizarre, strange situation where people will, let's say they have a preferred, like a special hat, like this is my hat, they'll take, they'll take the hat off, they'll, you know, they'll, you know, they'll always describe themselves doing something with it, or they'll always, you know, they'll put their hat down, put their hat up, they'll take it off, and, you know, they'll put it up, or they'll do things with it, because it's something there now, it's something that, that defines them. And people can sometimes play off each other. I remember why I had one player who chose a it was a, his gun. And that was his thing. It was a shotgun, I remember. That was his his keepsake. And that shotgun went through hit with him through the entire fucking campaign. It got out class pretty quick pretty quickly. But he kept it and he used it and he killed a bunch of things with it. He, like it was a it was his though. It wasn't anyone else's. It wasn't... It was his. And I think that's one of the parts that I like about Necronica and Ryukamiya in general. He does have some good ideas. Some really... <laughs> How do I wear this? Pleasant concepts. Uh, however, Ryukamiya also has what I like to call the, uh, the, 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 the Japan issue. And the uh, Japan issue is that he really likes young things. Uh, if if you'll quickly notice on the other two, one of the major characters in the last game was Eleven. The major game girl. Yeah. Or they had a flash drive. Uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, no. Uh, am I saying he's a lollycon? No. Am I saying that he may be possibly? Uh, bad. <laughs> Very bad. Uh, Fetters are also really interesting. A little, uh, it, this is a really good way of actually having a mechanical incentive for relationships. Hey, you're in love with the target so much it hurts. You don't want to, you don't want her to hate you. You can't take your eyes off her. It's embarrassing. Uh, if she won't look at me, I don't need this body. At the beginning and end of combat, damage one of your own parts. <laughs> Yeah, no, you are literally a. Yeah, you. It's like, hey, if my fetters, if the people I care about deeply, start going wrong, things start going wrong for you, and you want to be protective of them, and you want to hold them, and they want to hold you, and everyone wants to be friends with each other, but you were also like trying to drag away their body because half their lower limbs have been er eradicated. Uh, and someone else has, you know, someone else is firing back with their, you know, heavy machine gun because you have been overwhelmed and about to die. And then we have our fragments of memories, which we have a lot of memories. We have a total of 100. This is game actually uses the D10 system, which is a little bit odd. Uh, also, more frag memory fragments. 
And uh, don't worry, we have more fragment memories. And now we have our summary. Okay. Uh, okay, so um, okay, we can show the Alice. Okay. This is what it means by the skills. This is things that you can do. Regardless of your current place on the battle map, you are instantly transported to Eden. This is not considered a movement. Or it's things like other sisters' conversations checks toward you all gain a plus one to their roles. Make a conversation check with one of your sisters. Look how kawaii fucking uwu we are. Like, that's your entire jo job as an Alice. And that's one thing I enjoy. Is each character feels unique, and, and with all the different combinations, it's really easy to give it an idea of like, yeah, these are my characters. This is something I am, this is who my character is. Uh, can I show, and then you have all of your other ones. Uh, okay, I, I can somewhat show the automaton. I do not believe I can show the next one. Uh, yeah. Your battle, battle lolly. Don't think about it too hard. Uh, can I show you? Yes, I can show you. Yeah, you're... Uh, courts. Courts are your smart person, people. That's what they do. And you get things like advice. Anticipate. Composure. Very simple. Very easy. And very not complex. I mean, n none of these characters, no options in this game, is complex. But it's all the little parts that build on top of each other. That build on each other and with each other that makes this game be a lot more competent than it should be. And it creates, uh, for people I've talked to about playing Necronica and my vague memories of it, the game plays astoundingly well. But it's also okay. Can we show that? Um, I I don't I don't know. Holix. Okay. Um, Holix. Uh, you bad. Like sometimes it, but it does. It's one thing, and it doesn't really do anything out of that, which you'll quickly notice to be a trend to just about oh, actually a lot of JRPGs. You are playing a very specific game. You aren't playing Dungeons and Dragons. A game about going into dungeons and occasionally going into dungeons. This is you are occasionally going and fighting dragons. This is you are occasionally doing something completely fucking different. That doesn't matter. What matters is that you're playing the system and you're having fun. That's the game. Ha ha ha. Everyone clap, please. JTRPGs, though, are very different. I don't go into Necronica trying to play anything other than Necronica. I don't go into Maid to play anything other than Maid or a Maid-adjacent game like Dark Heresy. Which, if you may be wondering, wait, Dark Heresy? Yes, it works phenomenally well for it. This does lead to... Probably the hardest part about any JTRPG is getting into the idea, getting into the mindset. Because it's really easy to say, I like fantasy games. So I can roughly run kind of whatever fantasy game I'm thinking of at this time in D&D or whatever I feel like. You can't really do that in uh, JTRPGs. And some of them anyway. Other like Sword World, yeah, you probably could. But even then, it's, it's harder. You're playing a game first. That's the big thing. You're playing the game first. I don't go into playing a, you know, I don't go into playing Skyrim expecting my turn-based battle mode. That's not how it works. <laughs> I'm going in there to play fucking Skyrim. I'm going in there to play Final Fantasy. I'm going in there to play a very specific kind of game. I think one of the best ways to kind of compare it is a, you know, a role-playing video game versus something like Mountain Blade. Like Final Fantasy versus Mountain Blade. Mountain Blade, you can do a lot of things in that game that isn't necessarily the same. That isn't necessarily what you would consider to be like the main point. But you can also do it. But in like Skyrim, you're gonna go fighting. You're gonna be doing that. You can't really avoid that. 
Oblivion. You can't really avoid that. Mass Effect, you can't really avoid it. That's the same thing with these games. You cannot avoid the situation at hand. And that's not the point. The point isn't to, to avoid it. The point is to embrace it and to enjoy the, the madness. Uh, flow. Hmm. Ah, yeah, okay, give me one second. I'm, uh, do, do, do. Do, 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 do. There we go. Okay, I need to put you, like, right there. Right there. There we go. Uh, yeah, you also get to see why I, uh, I needed the notepad document for this. But, you get parts of this game which are inherently odd and strange and bizarre, but you can't help but appreciate some of the more bizarre natures of it. It's like, yeah, this is a completely weird fucking game, but it does exactly what it says on the tin. No part of this game lies to you, and that's one thing I enjoy about it. One thing I enjoy about Oliver Yukamiya's game, at no point does Necronica, Golden Sky Stories, Maid, ever lie to you about saying what it is or isn't. It tells you exactly right up front. We are a game about maids. We're a game about necromantic battle lollies, doing necromantic battle lolly things. That's just what the game is. And you're going to enjoy it, because that's what you are coming here for. And yeah, this is what I played. I liked Sorority because I like being able to uh, transport. I like being able to move people around. Yeah, they are upfront with you. All of these games are incredibly upfront with you about what they are. And they don't do anything other than what they say they are going to do. And I wish more Western games would follow that kind of philosophy. Some do, some don't. But we here in the West don't actually like that we do not like that mostly because of how we view games we view a D, &D game as something that we're investing in that we can invest a lot of time in there there's a reason why the concept of system mastery is such a big idea here but in japan it's like you can't really master necronica because that's not the point uh, you know, you like you can like oh yeah, I can make a character pretty quickly, and I understand how the combat system works, so I, you don't need to explain it to me again. But you can't really game the system as much as others. You know, you can't be like all right, time so the most optimal route of things. Being like yeah, you can try to optimize it, but the game has to fucking necromancer still just gonna skull fuck you because that's his job. It's literally his job description to fuck you horribly with an axe. In your skull, because he's going to kill you and make fun of you. But <laughs> all of these, oh jeez, yeah. If games were more upfront, you, I wouldn't have this gig. Yeah, pretty much, pretty fucking much. You know, I wouldn't really have be doing this. But uh, yeah, this is. Uh, did I play Baroque? Uh, yeah, I played no, I played a gothic. That's what I played. <laughs> Excel the power to revive yourself. I don't feel like dying today. Yeah, it's like you have the horrifying mutations, and you have gothics who were really cool, and all of these also have. All of these original little parts. And then we have a dance of... Whatever the fuck it was. The psychedelics. Uh, these are actually from the expansion. Yeah, they only get one. And yes, the translator note right there. Yes, only one. Uh, you know, requiems. And all of these have actions and things you can do. And but you may be noticing, notepad. Uh... Do I get all of these up front? And the answer is, yeah, you get all of these up fucking front. 
Why? Because you're supposed to. These characters aren't really supposed to last uh, multiple sessions, because you might play a game, and then it might be months before you play another one. So, you don't go into it saying, like, alright, time to, you know, session one of 20, you go and say, this is it, alright, we're done, cool. We had a fun time. Uh, you know, if you guys want to do, if you want to continue with these characters, awesome. If you guys don't, that's fine. We'll do something else. We'll, we'll, we'll play Draco Scourge next week. Or, hey, I found a cool new game. Let's play that. And like, everyone's like, oh, neat. That sounds like fun. How about we do that? And everyone's like, yay, everyone has, everyone cheers, and everyone's happy. And then you realize that the game doesn't, the game matters. But not as much as you know the the, the situations it produces, the, the people that you are interacting with, the fun time that you're enjoying things with, and all of the basic parts and all the reinforcement parts and all of like all of this plays well into each other. And I love all of it because you get it right off the bat. Like yeah, if you want to. You can't invest in a fucking anti-tank rifle as your. F Actually, I don't think you would invest in an anti-tank rifle, right? Now, she can you? No, you can't. Right away, you can't. But it's like, yeah, uh, I have a machine gun, or hey, I have a shotgun. <laughs> Fuck yeah, I can put my a shotgun in my arms. Why? Because I can. Screw you. Or here's all my mutations. Here's all my enhancements. But this is what summarizes the game, I think, the best. I don't think I need you anymore, but we'll keep you over there. Uh, this is what summarizes JRPGs, I think, perfectly. These are the four. These are the three situations of the game. You do your adventure phase, you do your battle phase, and then the end phase. Boom, boom, boom. Done. You don't. You don't have time for. Like, oh, time for the shopping session where we all go around and try to buy items and we try to haggle with the GM. Ha, ha, ha. No! Fuck that! We got two hours in this booth and I don't want to pay for a third! Bitch, we better be in the fucking end of the battle phase. I, I want this done in an hour and a half. <laughs> I don't want to pay. <laughs> we got karaoke. The entire game is built around those three things. You go into the, you do an incident, you have an action, you go into the battle, you perform the battle, then you end. That's it. Now the big thing is your action checks during the adventure and end phases. And if you notice, that's action at the adventure and end, not the battle phase. You don't even really need to do anything during the the battle phase i wouldn't say plays itself but it definitely is its own game and it's fucking awesome and it's really cool and i want to act i've been meaning to try to adapt it to another system or do its own thing with it just because it's so it and i love it so much but it's really hard actually <laughs> it's hard to actually take ideas from japanese games because they are so involved with themselves is that like you can't like you can't really strip away the Necronica from the Necronica. You can't take away hit the system from the Necronica very easily. But let's see, it's um ah yes. How can I forget? Uh, let's see. Uh, if you roll, it was where where is the check? Ah yes, uh, checks. Uh, let's see. You need to make a check. Essentially, rolling a ten-sided dice. If the result is five or hot, five or less, it's a failure. If the, where six or greater is a success. That's literally the system. It is a fifty-fifty. <laughs> you may be wondering, Notepad. That seems incredibly simplistic. Isn't there something more? Yeah, you get some bonuses here, and you get some bonuses there, and you can burn your parts to actually do roll more dice. That's it. Don't roll ones. And that's all that really needs to be it. Because it's a simple game. You're not really there for the adventure phase. You're there for the, I have a giant battle scythe and I'm going to chop into a horde of Nazi jo zombies because I hate everything and I hate existing. Ooga booga, I am death. This is also another very key thing. It's, uh, 
the game master has a very different role in JTRPGs. One of the big things is that it's he is seen as more of the, the master and commander than a referee. Let's get the permission from them. Let's get the okay. Can I do this? Yes. Can I do this? Yeah. There's a little bit more mother may I. But you also have to consider their second duty as we have two hours. Let's get fucking on with it. Or we have some time. We can slow down a little bit. That role of being more authoritative does play a very significant part into it. It is a very important part. And I actually enjoy that aspect of it quite a bit. It it, it shows a difference in perspective. And something I always enjoy reading. Do I believe in that philosophy of GMing? Absolutely not. But I do believe that it, it makes sense for why it exists. Uh, you can also go insane. Which uh, you will go insane and uh, don't do it. That's bad. Very bad, in fact. I could go deeper into like the mechanic complexity of things, but it's, I want the more introduce people into it. Like this is Necronica. Look at it, read it, understand it, because it is a awesome fucking game. Uh, let's see the flow of combat and all your actions. Everything is awesome, and I enjoy it. Like these checks are performed when attack maneuver is used. You perform a check to determine the location of the attack hits and look up the results below. Critical failure, two to five. You just fail to hit. All the location hits. And yeah, you can rip someone's head off right off the bat, or you can damage their torso, and everything means things. And then, like, location took damage has a number of parts equal to the amount, you know, has a number of parts equal to the amount of dam taking damage become damaged. Using recover during the end phase, explain later, these effective damage parts is lost. So it's very easy to die, because suddenly my arm is broken. Or something has been ripped off, or some, or I've been crippled in some way. One attack can cripple you. But that's fine. Uh, I'm talking one of these sentences. Remember, check, the check has failed. All parts in the location hit are damaged without regard. You're like, yeah, I'm getting my arm ripped off, and it's flying up. I'm getting my head chopped in half. Suddenly, my brain is coming out, but don't worry, I'm also kind of okay with it. <laughs> it's one of those bizarre things, and it's a, it uses an action point system, which can best be described as almost the battle wheel from Exalted. The idea of whoever, however has, whoever has the most action points will go, they can spend their action points and go down lower on the track. And you can keep going down the track until you hit zero, in which case everyone then regenerates all of their points, but you can't actually go into negatives. So let's say I have two action points left and I use an ability that takes five. I'm going to negative three, and if I restore ten, I would only go up to seven. I fucking adore this system. It's fast, it's easy, it's simple to understand, everyone knows what's happening, and you can also get that kinetic energy that you need in combat and things like this. You're going fast, you're dealing damage, you always know, it's like, okay, I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna spend four action points and that's gonna put me right above the enemy and I can totally do a second attack and ah! You know exactly what's happening. All the power is always in your hands. Never in someone else's. But it also encourages you to risk a bit. Oh yeah, you got two action points left. You could do a little, 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 little action, spend nothing. Or you can, or you can be a fucking man and be a badass and do something cool for once. You little doll, what are you, a doll or are you a cool person, like an action figure? And then you do it, and then the necromancer starts laughing at you, because now you have an insanely low amount of AP at the start of next turn, and then you get your shit rocked. That's the point. It's risk, it's reward, it's... Can I go deeper into this? Can I dedicate myself to these bigger attacks? Do I want to? 
can I afford not to? Or do I not want to? It becomes this back and forth. And I adore that. So, yeah, favor. Favor is your experience points. And there's not actually that much. Necronica is probably one of the few games that actually has like a decent, like, here's the session two in Japanese RPGs because of the nature of it. But he, he even addresses in the game being like, yeah, there's a good chance that you won't do that. Don't worry about it if you don't need to. Don't don't matter. Like it really it really doesn't doesn't matter all that much. But like give them karma, distinguish phases, give information, madness checks, all of these different little things. Like and then he's like, here's scripting. Make scripts, assign numbers, assign values, here's some memory fragments, here's dialogues, give hope. But each of them have their own reason for doing things. And this is all a bunch of various enemies that you can encounter. These all have... You may notice there's not any art. And you may be wondering, wow, that's kind of weird. Well, and you may also notice... Like, wow, the pages look a little bit small. Don't you see it? See, like, this big old gap over here? Well, the main reason is that a lot of these books are actually a lot smaller than you would think. Uh, I wonder if I can actually find one. Uh, Uh, let me see, where is this? Log Horizon one's pretty. Like, a lot of these ones don't actually... They're not actually very big, and they're usually fairly sparse on artwork, too. Uh, actually, I wonder, do I have a Wanzer Blade? Vanza. Uh, do I have my... Yeah, we have the Portuguese Kuro RPG. Yeah, they're very small. Uh, let me see. If I go to books that need uploaded. Metalhead is Japanese, yeah. Might. A lot of these books usually tend to be fairly small, like, relatively speaking. Like, you would think, like, oh, well, there's a lot here. Not usually. Like, they're usually fairly small and sparse on art. That's another big thing. Oh, uh, wait, I know. Uh, where's, ten where's my Tenra book? Uh, this one will be... We will go over this book eventually, because I actually kind of enjoy Tenra. It's very weird. But it's the kind of weird that I can get behind. Did I put under fantasy? It'd be weird if I did. Ah, yeah, here's Tenra. I need to double check to make sure that this is this is correct. Because the uh, Tenra rule book is sick. This book is freaking huge. Okay, right. so we're gonna open this up. So this is the Tenra, uh, Tenra Bancho Zero rulebook, and already you can kind of see, like the indent marks here. It says seven seven point five out of eleven point five, but these this isn't full size. Like you gotta remember, all of these are getting cut down. Like these are cut lines right here. I see up to when I worked at a. Um, print shop we had to use those a lot but like these books aren't very big they're very sparse on artwork which you know, we we here in the west were like japanese game obviously you must have artwork everywhere because it's just like my mongoos not really you get things like this it's like, all right, you know, here's some, like, clear, like, here's some artwork stuff going on. But, like, for every piece of artwork, you get a lot of nothing. Which is kind of a distinct difference. And even here, we can kind of see, with uh, once we get 
once we get through Necronica, there isn't actually that much art in Necronica. Tormenta's Brazilian D and D. &D. <laughs> yeah, no, but like Brazil actually has a really interesting culture when it comes to that. Um Brazil has a cool culture when it comes to that. Germany has an odd one. Eastern Europe in general has some very interesting parts. I do know Spain actually has a fairly extensive RPG scene that I would love to get into more. But uh I don't speak Spanish. I would say the I would say the West here in the US, UK, and I'd say Europe. Usually it's the US and Europe. We're the really only ones who are like, here is this big, thick, colorful book full of shit. And you know, the game kind of encourages that kind of like art arty farty. Like, you know, it's you're not really buying the book for the rules, you're buying the book for You're, you're buying the book for the art half the time, which is a fact I, I went over in my Morkborg video on my YouTube channel, which you should totally check out. I have a gun and I'm not willing to, I'm not willing to use it. Yeah, it's just like, it's always odd. And that's what, that's one thing I enjoy. It's always interesting to see other people's culture when it comes to role-playing games. That's one thing I, I adore. I always enjoy listening to other people you know, talk about their particular countries, uh, their tactics, the reason, like, why they do the things that they do. Everything is, oh, the natural end point of everything is to become, uh, you know, you know, a Game of Thrones. That's just kind of the joke. Uh, based on creating horrors, creating savants. Uh, oh. Then we have a lot of like, here's some more options for, let's describe your, you know, character more on the Factory of the Dead. And uh, I do not actually have the one, the sample of scenario, which isn't actually, doesn't actually follow any of the rules. <laughs> that was hilarious. Uh, that one ends really weird. You can find it if you look hard enough. But like, the character, like, <laughs> to be honest, character creation is like fairly simple there's just a lot to it and there's a lot of stuff in this game i think that's like kind of the key part to understand is that there's a lot of stuff here's your brains here's your eyeballs here's your fists forearm shoulders spine entrails foot bones and here's like oh are you in limbo are you in asylum are you in hades are you in tartarus are you in eden or maybe you're you can go to hades and you can go to asylum uh, but don't forget about your action point value, very important. And oh, don't forget about all your icons. Uh, and don't forget about your enemy icons. Look at the horror, look at the legion, look at the savants. They're all nasty, do a animu bullshit. And it's like... Necronica is, I think, a, a testament to how do we take an idea and bring it to the absolute limit. How do we take in a single concept, a single idea, and say, all right, here's what we're going to do with it. We're going to commit the entire game to this one singular concept. Nothing else, nothing more. I think that's what you end up with. And I know the JTRPG guys are going to get mad at me. Uh, because Ryu, Ryu Kamiya is kind of out of the out of the loop. Like he is very much an auteur, but I want to go over what's been translated. What's kind of that we see here? What was the first ones translated? What's the big ones being translated? Because I feel that's important. You know, in context, it's really easy to say, "Well, you shouldn't take Kamiya's stuff. You know, you shouldn't take any of this really that seriously." Because he's an outlier. He's a weirdo. But there's a reason why Necronica has a fully translated 246-page community-driven document. 
and uh, Sword World, let's actually take a look. Here's Sword World. Let, let's go to Combat Rules. Ooh. Oh boy, here's the Magic Rules. It's on the fucking fandom site. Or like, oh boy, here's... Like, let's go to Peace Player Characters, and oh boy, look at all these. Here's all the extra damage effects, and also you no know, character sheets has been translated. Lamau, what do you think we are? Anything other than anything other than this. Sword World, it doesn't have a translation, and there's probably a fuck ton of games out there that we don't see. We won't see. Just because they're little and odd and no one's going to touch them. Because, like, who the fuck cares? That's how people are going to see it. And that's sad in its own way. Because it would be like, well, any of my games getting any popularity in Japan. There's no reason to. To them, it's just another game. But it's not big, it's not important, doesn't have anything unique to it. It's just itself. So we should embrace that. It does its own thing. But the next game, we're, we're gonna we're gonna make it a little bit lighter instead of chainsaw battle lollies. We're instead going to go to the countryside. Welcome to Golden Sky Stories. Possibly the most laid back, relaxing game. I have ever had the pleasure of reading. Mostly because I would never play this game. <laughs> because I hate the mechanics in the game. I mean, I, I despise the, the, the diceless bullshit Mother May I stuff. I don't like it. There's a lot of that in this game. But when you consider the fact that it's literally about tiny animal people going on tiny animal people adventures and everyone is like 12, it's like, ah, yes, I understand. <laughs> like, I understand why it is the way that it is, because, well, shit, everyone's a bunch of fucking animals or tiny animal people. We do tiny animal people thing, and you should all cry. Look how adorable they are. Ooh, woo, it's adorable. You can also tell who the main characters are. We are all Shota Cat Boys. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. We're all Shota Cat Boys here. But yeah, actually, uh, that is that. There are, there, are, there are actually no Henge boys in this series, which is another one of those Kamiya, like, Kamiya, Kamiya, is there something you would like to, like to tell us? Uh, but, like, all of these characters are girls. Every single one of them. Uh, we also have the cultural notes here. Yeah, we have, and everything is split up in the spring. And one thing I like about it is that it really encourages you to embrace the Jap Japanness of it. Like, yeah, we're here's the fox. Look at the fox. Look at the fox goddess. Look at her. Everyone, clap, please. Oh, look, it's the raccoon dog. It's it's Rico, the raccoon dog. And she looks like she's 13, and I'm going to jail. Well, fuck. Alright, let's go back up. Uh, yeah, no, very cute. Uh, as you can see, all the artwork is very cute. Let's quickly go through it. Look at that. Uh, yeah. Th Hopefully, yeah. Look into look at the main characters. That's Rico, and that's I can't remember her name. 
very, very kawaii ugu, if you catch my drift. You can play Cat Boys if you feel like it, but, um... Yeah, that's not the point. <laughs> but, uh, cultural notes, spring. I should really remember when I hit... See, my, my, my key here is actually a three on my numpad, and sometimes I hit it on accident. Because uh, I don't have two monitors. I have one monitor, so I've been doing this all on... Uh, yeah, one more. It sucks. This isn't easy. Please kill me. But yeah, it's, it's cute things doing cute things for cute reasons. And like, here's the fox girl. Here is the raccoon dog. Here is the cat. And you act like a cat. You act like a fucking... Uh, you technically she looks 15 but she she isn't really she's a cat and like oh no it's a dog look she it's a dog ooh woo look it's a rabbit uh i'm going to jail now and i wish i could actually put these side by side to give you the full piece but uh it does that because there is someone made a boo boo up here uh this wasn't supposed to be here. If this wasn't here, I'd be able to, but it is, so I can't. Like, here's the bird. She's a bird. How, how old does she look? <laughs> yeah, like, she just... They don't even tell you how old she is. Like, here's the sample story, and... The game is almost aggressively kawaii. Like, if Necronica was Gap Moe, and Maid was just pure, unadulterated harem Moe, this one is... like, sitting on the porch of your, you know, beautiful Japanese countryside home and being like, do doing 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 God, it's such a beautiful in my Japanese countryside home. Look at all the beautiful, wonderful pieces of nature and animals going around. And, ah, yes, how can we forget my best friend, Mr. Frog, who's also a local god in this area. Wink. But don't worry, don't tell the kids, even though they can see all the animals and I ha ha ha. Yeah, tiny fraction of the ones you can tell with the game. The thing is, there are... This game is about telling a single kind of story, but you can kind of do different things with that. If Maid was about telling harem anime adventures, Necronica is about telling your very dramatic anime adventures, this one is your slice-of-life bullshit. Hence why I kind of almost said Lucky Star would be a phenomenal game for this. Just the idea of, yeah... We're gonna go help out Mr. Todoroki and help him build something. Like that's gonna be a that's gonna be like an entire session of using the power of magic and friendship to help a community build something. Or oh, ooh, woo! I made I made a boo boo and uh, I need to help a kid. Uh, you know, learn about the power of friendship and how. Don't worry, your friends will your friends will come back. Oh no, ooh, woo! Uh, and then you have the powers. Now, what this means, this value doesn't really mean anything right now. However, that value is effectively, yeah, the golden size story supplements are really cool as well. I'm not looking at those, but you totally should, because the golden sky story supplements add a lot to the game and add a lot more stuff. Doesn't really change the core. How do I word this? It doesn't change the core ideas, though. That's kind of one of the reasons why I want to kind of go over Golden Sky Stories, is that it does not change the core concept of the game. You can add everything you want, but you're not really going to change Golden Sky Stories, regardless of what you add. But that isn't bad. That isn't bad at all, and I'm okay with that. So... This value is what kind of makes this game odd, because this is a diceless game. And it is an aggressively diceless game. <laughs> and I actually like this. I actually like 
some of the, the powers and the fact like, oh, hey, if I get a, you know, a power, I need to, you know, to get a new power, I need to take a problem. So it's like, oh, hey, if I want to float, you can float through the sky at a leisurely pace, move anyway speed per person can walk, but getting up high gives you a plus two bonus to checks for searching for things. But it's, I have to take, oh, I'm strange. You speak and dress in a way that's out of touch with the times because you stand out so much you can't really hide. If you're walking around town in human form, it'll draw everyone's attention. That's cool. That's fine. I'm down with it. Kind of gives, gives personality. Or the fact that, you know, the raccoon dog, the tanukis, they can produce fake money. <laughs> yes, they can commit tax evasion. <laughs> Or you can turn, become anything, or, you know, you can become Tanuki, you, you can drum on their bellies. Or for, make a copy of a person. But you also get other problems like, oh no, you want to relax, you, you know, oh no, any, you can't put your annual attribute above one when you create your hand. And if you want to raise them check, you have to spend one extra point of feelings. Oh no, you gotta spend feelings. Uh, like cats are like, ooh woo, you are a kitty. Like kitty and fuzzy and peek into hearts, but you get things like being lazy or you can't swim, but you get acrobatics or you get all these really cute things. And that's like the. The, the You can almost argue to be the um, crux of this game. Here's a bunch of cute things. Everyone, everyone clap, please. Or you get the mochi is the kind of rice cake that probably rice to a paste. The Japanese people traditionally make it during New Year's big wooden hammer to pound the rice. In Japanese folklore, says a rabbit and the moon spends his time pounding mochi. Yeah, you just get a power to make mochi. Why? Who, who the fuck knows? Fuck you, that's why. That's all, that's that's what you get. That's that's your power. You get the ability to make mochi. But, this, I think, actually has a really good section about what, mochi is fucking expensive. I think this actually has probably one of the best, like, GM things you can do about, because at the end of the day, the game isn't really about the game. It's not about me roll, me roll dice, me get big number, me clap. It's about the connections. It's about the emotions, about the people, about the situations you find yourself in, and how your character goes about it. Oh no, someone's moving away from this tiny town. What do we do to celebrate? What do we do to remember him? What do we do to, you know, bring about this time when he's leaving? He's not coming back. And do we feel sad? Do we feel happy? Do we, you know, try to, what do we do? Or someone's coming home. Someone's coming back to town. Do we prepare something for them? What happened to them? Did they change? Did we change? Do we still have our old friends? What happens when things changed a little bit too much? Well, they don't understand, or they change too much, and you don't understand. It's, a, it's about that changing narrative. It's not about cute animal people doing cute animal people things. It's about the connections. It's about the relationships we form and how we go about forming them. And I love that about this game. That's a common thing you notice with Kamiya's games. He does like the concept of relationships. And that's actually one of the big things. He was actually a big inspiration for me when I was writing a lot of my relationship systems. Is the idea that there's a lot more to a relationship than simply, you know, friend, dislike, mean, or whatever. There's a lot of nuance the things and even a game simple like this like you could play this with kids and they will understand it arguably they'll understand it a hell of a lot more but it's also that um how do i word this 
it's also e it's easy enough for kids to understand, but it also has a, some of the odder bits that like kids are gonna want to kind of avoid that they don't quite understand. I think one of the harder bits is ironically how wonder and feelings work. Because again, game is diceless. So let's say, for example, I have a animal skill of one. Uh, you know, I'm not very animalistic in the way I handle things. However, I need to make a check, and and you know, game master says, "All right, check is going to be two. I need to spend my feelings to increase it by one." This is where things get a little bit messy because your wonder is your hinges bonds towards others special powers however your feelings are the bonds others feel toward the henge and you can use it to strengthen or use different attributes like it's like oh here's a bunch of management things like here's manage points here and then manage the points here and then you got to spend the point this points to do this and this points to do this would it have been easier if this was a dice-based system? Maybe. Maybe. But overall, like, if you enjoy this kind of game, if you want to tell a story, if you want to introduce, like, some younger kids to be like, hey, let's do basic math together and let's learn about friends, then there's worse games to play. If you want to, like, if you... I would, arguably, I think the perfect age for this game, the perfect, like, little circular age would be that 15 to 16 age, that teenage, that kind of early teen, that kind of teenage years, because they can still understand the childlike wonder you're going through, but they also understand the importance of connections, of dealing with people, mostly because of how combat is handled. Everyone make a guess of how combat is handled. I, I, I dare y'all, don't worry. Very, very very important how combat is handled. <laughs> also, one thing, this is kind of silly. I don't like the like how different transformations at different times cost different amounts. So you have the base amount, you know, but I want to become completely human, but I only want, but I don't want my tail, so it costs four. Like, things get really weird. And we have, oh, we have the strength in our connections, and we have to make friends, and we have to produce dreams. Which, dreams are like a meta-currency. That is the one thing I fucking despise about this game, is that dreams are a meta-currency. Dreams are a meta-currency that other players have to give you. Which I am never a fan of. There are some ways to get it. Be like, well, if you just play in a scene, you get something. But I've never been a fan of reward play, like players reward players, because there becomes this bizarre like you don't want to reward players all that often, and then be like, well, you rewarded him three things, only rewarded me two. Mm, I feel sad, like you're a fucking asshole, and no one wants to. No, no one wants to give you anything. And that's kind of the idea. It's like, you want to... I wish there was a system in here that would be like, yeah, you get a, here's a consistent amount of dreams. Or here's a consistent amount of method to get this currency. But there isn't. And it's entirely based on what other players want to give you versus what you give to other players. And it's like, oh, okay, that's kind of, kind of odd. Uh, there is no health in this game. Um, there is no combat in this game. Let's remember this. Combat is a meme in this game. Uh, however, instead of doing damage, you surprise people. Like, oh no! Like, you're a fucking dog that can turn into a person. I'm horrified now. Science gone too far, put a gun to it, and I need to run away from it. And it's like, oh no, I'm surprising. It paints and falls down. And there is technically some options for problems, which you can have like a level eight surprise uh, by by eating something as a problem, which you could fall down and faint immediately. However, this is combat. Fighting is not a good thing. You really mustn't fight, but sometimes it happens anyway. Uh, animal or adult. 
uh, <laughs> however, yeah, uh, whoever gets the higher result wins, the loser can run away or get knocked down. However, we can't stress this enough, you need to avoid trying to solve problems with violence as much as possible. Horseplay among friends is one thing, but you mustn't go picking fights with people you don't know all that well just because you don't like them. Even if you do want to fight, nothing good can come of it. If your town connection is to three or higher, it drops to two if you get into a fight. There is a chance you can lose lose the game by getting into fights. Uh, that's bad. Is it bad in game? No, I actually really enjoy that mechanic because it's a direct disincentive to get into combat. Because players have a very bad tendency of saying, well, all options have been drained, it's time to kill them. Being like, you have tried nothing except the kill them option. So kind of having that, you know, the, the gun, the metaphorical gun to their head being this like, just, just don't do that. Just stop it. It, it works. I think it works actually exceedingly well. Uh, but yeah, no, literally the mechanic for fighting is if you roll higher, the other person gets knocked over and everyone starts crying. Because you're an asshole. Yeah, cute. Very, very cute kitty. Pet kitty. Uh, threads... Yeah, Threads is an unfamiliar connection that endures through multiple stories, and the, the other person might appear in a given story. Which is another big thing about this game, that there is a technically a method to go from point A to point B, but also not. It's very light in how it handles it. It's very much made for those one-shots. Now, this is actually one of my favorite parts. This is, uh, let me see, this is the... Uh, which one is this? No, this isn't... Here we go. This is actually a really fun, like, section that I like, encourage a lot of people to read. The idea is everyday magic. It's witch quest. <laughs> everyday magic stories, heartwarming stories about everyday life in which some magic makes them a little bit more interesting, a little bit more wondrous. Nonviolent role playing, and it's about little stories. This isn't about saving the world. This is about making sure someone gets the do gets the karate practice on time. That's big shit going on. You know, th this is life or death. Someone needs to get to karate practice, or oh no, someone needs help fixing the little dojo up so we can all have a party in it. That's some like catastrophic Dante must die here shit going on in Golden Sky stories. Not much else. You don't need it to make it. <laughs> oh, it's actually... No, I will try to I will try to hunt down that game. Witch Quest. Uh, I have to remember that one. I will... You know, let, let's... I'll try to find Witch Quest. Majo... Majo no Kai. It seems like an interesting little game. Uh, but and it's also about little stories. I think one of the hardest parts about any game, game master in general, is that it's really hard for people to think of stories and think of adventures that don't involve something a lot bigger, something bigger going on, because we've been kind of trained to say that's what a story is. A story is big and grand and wonderful, and or there's something else going on if there is a smaller story. No. It's small stories are just fine. Also, I hate this, this section right here. Uh, whoever laid this out should get shot. Because this looks terrible. Why would you do that? Why? Why? Just, just don't do that. Just stop doing that. I understand it's Japanese, but you can do it. I believe in you. And then we have the Game Master section, which... Cool stuff. Use it. Create stuff. Because there are a lot of points in this game that... Oh, so we have the, another story. Ha ha ha, look. Ooh, ooh, look. 
It's cute anime girls. Or do you enjoy your cute anime girls? That's literally what this episode's going to be. Rico's big mistake. Don't worry, here's the goddess of the rock. All the various shrine scenes. Oh no, we're crying in the middle of the night because we're sad. We need to find a puppy. Oh, woo, it's a puppy. Then you have things like, oh, bears, bees, chickens, like all the various little animals. Apparently you can play animals. I didn't know that this rule actually existed. Uh, I don't know why everything has these eyes. I don't know. It's kind of freaking me out, not gonna lie. <laughs> also, we cannot forget the people. Don't worry, everyone. We have diligent people. The princess. Ooh, woos, we have siblings. The mismatched couple. The city person. Ha <laughs> ha! Hey, city! We have... A literal baby! It's just a baby! The grumpy old man! The lady from the general store! The Buddhist priest! Oh, and then we can't forget about the someone leaving town. Oh no, everyone, let's cry. There's gonna be something important. We need to put people in stories. Look at them, they're all so cute. Fuck! And I think that kind of sorts out like a lot of the what the game is at its core. It's like, here are... How do we make a J Japanese game? And you're like, here's Hitsuna Town, and here's all the various parts of Hitsuna Town. Uh, Hikosuna, and like, it's pretty, and there's a lot of stuff going on, and there's kawaii anime things going on, and there's, the artwork's pretty, everything about it has this very, um, yeah, it, that, that's the best way kind of to sum it up, like, it's your daily country sound visual novel, and I like that about it, I think that's one of the key things, I enjoy that part of Golden Sky Stories. I think that's a part that we... Here in the West, we don't really get games like this. Because we have that, you know, desire, like, we want bigger, exciting adventures that are, well, bigger and exciting, and whoa, look, it's big, it's wacky, it's something massive. That It's an investment of time and effort and resources and people that you don't want to play for an hour when everyone has to set aside in, in the evening to do. No, you gotta do something big. It's Blue Rose somewhat does that, but even Blue Rose has kind of like the grandiose setting behind it. You know, it's... This one is quite literally Japanese countryside, town living, You except you're all playing little animal people who may or may not be real and you may just be kids being dumbasses who the fuck knows we live in a society but that's one thing I enjoy about Golden Sky stories and I think I enjoy a lot about when Yukami's work in general is that there's a distinct distinctive Japanese flavor to everything it's unmistakably Japanese. However, that unmistakable Japanese-ness does allow it to experiment a bit more, to get outside the box. And one thing that I will always say is I love novelty. I adore novelty. Because I think it's important. There are a dozen fantasy games out there. There's a dozen science fiction games you can play. A dozen more being published day, you know, every every month. A dozen more in production. But not many 
can really claim Golden Sky Stories pitch. Not many can pitch Necronica's you know, combat. Not many people can even come close to understanding the madness that is made. And I enjoy that. I enjoy that quite a bit. Is his works flawless? Absolutely fucking lutely not. He does have a pitch. He does have a, a preference when it comes to things. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, everyone has their preference. But it does come down to like, uh, yeah, well, we kind of know what you enjoy. But I wish... I wish perhaps here in the West we kind of understand that a little bit more. We're allowed to go outside the box. That we're allowed to poke things. But not inherently try to make a statement about something. Try to, you know, inspire others or something like that. Because if you notice the past three games absolutely had nothing. Nothing. Even close to having a, a bent, an angle of some sort. There was no politics, there was no exterior motives. It was just, let's make a game. Now, did Ryu Kamiya want to make money off of these? Well, obviously, he's, he's fucking selling them. But I think the goal was, how do I create a fun game first? How do I do anything else second? And I appreciate that. I appreciate that from the, the bottom of my cold, dead heart. That it's someone who cares. Someone who understands that... It's easy to make a game. It's hard to make a game that's fun. That people want to enjoy. That people actively go out to enjoy. And... Am I saying every Japanese RPG is like that? No. God, no. <laughs> and I think that's one of the biggest issues, too, is that we... We see what's being put out there. I mean, we don't see Sword World. We see Made RPG. We see Golden Sky Stories. We see Necronica. We see Ryutama. We see all these different games that would be traditionally like, oh, hey... These are very Japanese games, and we don't see the odd ones, because of course they're not going to get published out outside of their own small circles. But, I would be curious to see more. I'd like to see Jack of Scourge, which is, if I can pull, you know, let me pull it up. Uh, I'm going to fucking butcher this on YouTube. If we go here, uh, yeah, Dracoscur, which is, if I remember correctly, the pitch is the world exploded and like the sun, something happened with the sun, and now vampires rule everything, and everyone has to kind of deal with that. Like, it, it's pretty fucking metal at some point. Like, yeah, all right. I'm I'm cool with that. Like I'm curious to see. You know, you kind of see some of more. Like you know, Dracula Scourge very much it, it has its own uh, personality, of its own artwork. Uh, his other one was the Tanko Saga. <laughs> As you can see, it's a very Japanese and. Another one of those books, like, no one really has any fucking idea what, that, what it's about. It's just like, yeah, it's a fantasy game, all right. There's something there. We don't know what it is, but it's definitely present. Uh, this is the Log Horizon. Yeah, this is the Log Horizon game. Uh, and, uh, I'm going to Google Zetai Reido, Uh, but I'm going to have... That's not it. Yeah, oh god. See, I'm I'm going through here, because I'm... Oh god, okay, that's a no-no. 
Uh, oh, that's a no-no. Oh, sweet Jesus. Oh, oh no. Uh, uh, look at me. Oh, no. Jesus. Okay, get out of here. I need to leave. Uh, there's Fuda. <laughs> like, there's a lot of games out there. Yeah, no, there's there's a lot of games that we we don't see. And I don't think we'll ever truly get the full appreciation. Because you get things like th this nightmare. Uh this is this is the Goblin Slayer TRPG. Yeah, there's a Goblin Slayer TRPG. It's based on the standard role playing system. It's not exactly a complex uh, game. However, it is amusing because there's an entire section about it which effectively says, don't just kill goblins, save the world. And I'm like, bitch, I am not buying a goblin slayer game to not kill goblins. Ah, oh, god, where else is it? What other ones are there? Yeah, also, to give you the, the size of things, like, that is a person's hand. Like, this book is not big. Um, what other what other RPG was there that was odd that I think would... Like, games that we just don't really hear about all that much. If I look hard enough, I look hard enough, there's probably some fucking visual novel. Now, Black Cat, you may be wondering, why? What's the point of a Goblin Slayer game? The answer is, I don't know. <laughs> and I remember distinctly when it released, everyone on TG was like, why? It's D&D 5th edition. Because he literally pulls out a D&D &D character sheet at one point for his adventure license. He's like, yeah, this is my fucking character sheet. And I'm like, oh, yeah. And the entire gimmick is like, yeah, it's a TRPG. Uh, and if I remember correctly, Goblin Slayer is actually based on one of the campaigns the writer was in. It was in a D&D &D campaign he was in. And he wasn't Goblin Slayer. He played another... I think he... I didn't think he played Priestess, but I think he played, like, Lizard Man Shaman or something. But... It was the idea, like one of it, like a guy he knew was playing goblin, was playing proto goblin slayer, and being like, "Yeah, I just want to kill things, like that is my one goal in life. I have no other personality outside killing this one particular race. I have an affinity for killing." And it's like, "Yeah, oh, what, what, what kind of, what kind of person would act like that?" And that's all goblin slayer is at the end of the day. I think the main point, from when I remember reading the chunks of it. Uh, no, thankfully, no. Uh, <laughs> but... I believe... I believe... It was... Like, pretty much all the characters in that thing, the reason why they're named that is because he was like... These are characters he encountered during his time playing D&D &D and such. That's why nobody has names. Because that's like that's how Goblin Slayer refers to them as. I mean, it's like yeah, I don't know who you are. you're. You're an elf wizard, I guess. So you're just elf ranger to me. You have no other name except elf ranger. But like the main thing with like the Goblin Slayer TRPG is you're mo it's mostly going into like the world more than anything. I mean, like yeah, this is what like sword Catholicism is like. Hey, this is what uh like. The, how, why, go, how goblins work and how like the demon invasion is going and it's like okay like that's a point you can go across because yeah that's a plot in the in in the in the fucking manga and such that there's just a demon invasion going on but no one cares <laughs> Because it's not goblins. Uh, what was the other really odd JRPG that uh, I have an affection for? But I, uh, oh yeah, Mayuka Kingdom.
uh, which literally translates into Dungeon Kingdom, which is a game about running a country, but it is in a dungeon, except the entire world is a dungeon. And you're, like, the entire fucking world is just a big fucking dungeon. That is literally it. Congratulations, welcome to Mayuka Kingdom. And it's, like, weirdly card-driven in some ways. Apparently, actually, though, Miyuka Kingdom is giving a translation. It's some of the books are. Uh, not the actual game itself, but some of like the side books are getting translated by Yen Press in a few months, which everyone's like, "Ooh, that's interesting!" Like, I'm fascinated. I'm curious to see how that goes. Uh, what are some other odd ones? Like, you've got Sword World, uh... Uh, you have Tokyo Nova, which is a card-driven RPG, which is a cyberpunk game. We're gonna be taking a look at that one in a while, probably. It was card-driven. And then you have a... Let me, let me bring up my a personal favorite of mine. So, we all know Shadowrun, right? Have you ever played Japanese Shadowrun, though? <laughs> Welcome to Japanese Shadowrun. Uh, because if anyone knows the lore of the original, uh... Oh, well, Electron. Electoration, oh god. Vampire. Uh, Dracoscourge, I believe. Just Google Ryukami and it shows up. But, um... Like, here's the... like In, in lore of Shadowrun, like, Japan is, like, really xenophobic and they hate everyone that isn't Japanese. Uh, uh, J Japan Shadowrun? Nah, so fucking lutely not. There's your orc. Do you like your orc? <laughs> Alright, there's your elf in a china dress. Uh, don't worry about the troll. Uh, don't think about it too hard. Please stop. <laughs> oh no. But yeah, like, you get a lot of these. I wonder, is there, um... Black Lagoon, uh, TRPG. I'm, I'm, I'm... Why do I think there is one of these? Is there? No, there isn't. There's not one. I could have swore there was one. But there are a lot of Japanese tabletop games out there that we don't see. And I don't think we'll ever see a lot, a majority of them. That sucks. I wish we would. I wish we could. But that is the curious case of Ryo Kamiya's games. I could go over, you know, Jack Scourge and what we do know about it. I could go over it. I could also go over... Uh, Zetai Reido and how that's going, but those aren't translated, so I don't think a majority of people are going to care. Uh, the JTRPG guys are, of course, going to care because uh, they're weird. And I love them to death, though. Don't get me wrong. I love them to death. They're going to... Uh, they're doing their thing, and that's what they're going to do. They ain't going to do anything else. And... Uh, yeah, no, hell, uh, if you can find them, play them. And I adore Japanese game design. And I would be curious to see more, but they love their Call of Cthulhu. They adore Call of Cthulhu. And I would be curious to see what else is there. So I'm hoping people, uh, I'm hoping this introduces people to things. Like, that. at the end of the day, I think that's what the curious case is for. I wish I could introduce people. I hope people find things they enjoy. So everyone, my name is Notepad Anon. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Godspeed, good luck. And on Monday, we will continue Road Redemption, Red Mist Running, get that working. And we will continue from there. Goodbye. I'll catch you all on the flip side.